So welcome everyone. Great to be here with you again, be back together again. Um, another cold day here in the Washington area. I think it's a little below zero. The last two or three weeks we've had snow. Um, and I think we're all looking forward to the spring, wherever you are. And welcome those who are joining us from Father Afield, Collins in uh, Walnut Creek, California, and Kerry in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and Claudia in Baltimore, Steph in Pittsburgh, and uh, let's see, Kirsten on the Outer Banks, Daphne in San Diego, and uh, Susan in Pittsburgh. Welcome everyone. So in these recent weeks, um, what, what I've been endeavoring to do is begin with a meditation and then do a short talk. And the intention is um, then to, for Emily to lead us in, um, in some movement. <clears throat> and then we'll have some, <coughs> excuse me, we'll have some time for sharing in groups and uh, then we'll come back together again and um, have, a, have a final meditation and uh, finish with some announcements. So really glad to be together again. Lovely to have the Sangha here in, uh, in the DC area, Washington area, but also folks farther afield. And uh, as some of you know, maybe a lot of you know, I do a session before the class um, on Insight Timer, I do a live session. And the theme of that session today was when death comes and uh, quite a lot of people came along for when death comes and uh, kind of a reflection that rather than being morbid, a morbid thing to reflect on death, it actually is something that can help us to live more fully, more compassionately, more courageously. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, as in many other traditions, it seemed to be um, a, a quite a, a very skillful thing to do to, to reflect on death. Um, in, uh, I recall uh, Carlos Castaneda in his books, you know, about Don Juan, the Yaqui shaman sorcerer, who, who would see a death as always having death on your left shoulder. You know, and if you want if you had a question, you could turn and ask your death the question. Um, and in, as I say, in many traditions, there's a, there's a great wisdom in reflecting on the impermanence of, of life. That when we are caught up in, um, you know, just seeking pleasures in ephemeral experiences, then that isn't actually a path of, of happiness and a path of freedom or well-being. But that reflecting on impermanence, um, sickness, aging, death, is actually a way that we can live more, more fully and more wisely and more, more kindly. So I want to reflect on that today. But uh, rather than getting into the, the, the substance, um, the content, Thought we'd begin with a, with a meditation. And uh, just a, appreciating this, uh, us all being, being able to be together in this way and practicing together. So maybe just taking some moments to find a, a posture, comfortable posture, whatever that is for you, sitting or lying down.
whatever will allow you to be, be here with a sense of ease. You could let your eyes close, let your attention come inward. You might invite the attention to drop down out of the thinking mode where we spend a lot of our time down into the body, feeling the body in contact with the surface beneath you chair or the cushion. Feel the weight of your body pressing down, contact of your feet with the floor, your hands with your lap or your knees, or one hand with the other, touching the other. Taking some moments to settle, make any adjustments in your posture, to let yourself be as comfortable as you can be. So letting the chest be open, invite the shoulders to relax, inviting a sense of, of ease. I find it helpful to, <clears throat> to come back to Martha Postlethwaite's poem, Clearing. She says, do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is yours alone to sing falls into your open cupped hands and you recognize and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to this world so worthy of rescue. So if that's a, <clears throat> a help, helpful image for you, just creating a space, creating a clearing. Each one of us in coming here, in meditating or coming to community, we're creating a space in our life. We're kind of putting aside the daily obligations, the other things we might be doing, the TV we might be watching or the papers we might be reading, uh, things we might be doing. And, and we're, we're creating this space, this clearing in the dense forest of our lives and just inviting a kind of a receptive awareness to what's present, just waiting with our open cupped hands for whatever might be revealed in the silence, in the stillness, in the clearing. And then out of the stillness, we can go back into the world with maybe a, a little more calm or space, kindness, wisdom. So creating this space. You might take a few deeper breaths to help yourself relax and settle. Breathing in, calming the body. Breathing out, calming the mind. You might invite a smile to your face. Just invite letting the corners of the eyes and the corners of the mouth come into the expression of a smile. It can be helpful to think of a loved one, someone who easily makes you feel happy or joyful. 
Maybe letting their image come into your mind, into your heart. Just inviting that. Relaxing the smile. Coming back to the smile anytime if you're feeling it would be helpful, if you're feeling stressed or tense, it's inviting the smile. Also coming back to the breath. Taking a deeper breath if you find yourself tensing up or worrying or feeling anxious about anything. And help to, to, to reflect on some things in our life that we're grateful for. It's another way of shifting out of the focus on what's wrong or what we lack or what we don't have. We can be caught up in that a lot. Just inviting a reflection on things we have, our health, maybe our loved ones. So many things that we often take for granted. Just letting yourself settle and inviting a receptive awareness to whatever's present. You might scan your body, your consciousness, your mind, to see if anything is calling for attention, anything standing out. And make room for what's here. If there's some tension in the body, you might just bring awareness to that and meet it with kindness, with acceptance. Let any feelings, sensations come and go. Any mood or emotions that may be present. There might be some heaviness or feeling of negativity or sadness. Let your attention come to that feeling or that emotion, mood. See if you can welcome, welcome the guests, as Rumi says, even if they're a crowd of sorrows who sweep your house empty of its furniture. Treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. It can be helpful to to use an anchor for our awareness. Could be the breath, could be sounds, could be bodily feelings where we rest our attention. Let that be our focus or our home base. For many of us, the the experience of breathing, just being aware of breathing in and breathing out is a very helpful, helpful focus.
experiencing the sensations of the breath just as it is. <clears throat> breathing in, breathing out. And if the, the mind gets caught up in a thought or a story, when you notice that, you can just kindly and gently let your attention come back to the body, the breath. You might notice how the mind can often have a mind of its own, maybe moving into thoughts about plans for the future or something that happened that feels sticky or unresolved. Maybe worries. Or just daydreams, you know, just feeling kind of floating around and going off into thoughts. And whenever that happens, you know, whenever we do get caught up, get pulled away, and just gently and kindly come back. Not to make it into a problem. And if we do make it into a problem, just to meet that with kindness. So that whatever's arising can be held in kindness, met with acceptance. You can find the Four Noble Truths in just in this moment, in any moment. Just notice if there's, if there's suffering, if there's anything you're resisting or clinging to or spacing out from. And just pay attention to that. Notice if there's holding if you're trying to have something or have a feeling be a certain way or get rid of something you don't like, and just notice that when it comes under the overall term of craving and pulling something towards this, pushing it away, spacing out. And 
And if there is holding, is it possible just to gently relax that holding? Maybe let go of it, making space for the sensations without being caught up in a story, how things should be or shouldn't be. <clears throat> and letting go is the third of the noble truths, freedom from suffering, from letting go of holding, of craving, And the fourth of these noble truths is, is the, the practice, the path of training. In this case, the path of meditation practice and wise effort to be aware of our experience and to, to let go of holding. The Buddha said in this fathom long body is found suffering, the cause of suffering, the end of suffering and the path to the end of suffering. All here available now, right now in any moment. So if there's no obvious suffering, you can experience maybe the freedom, the peace that comes from not being swept up in something, caught up in something. And the path, <clears throat> the path of practice to help you be aware of it. Path of meditation. want to finish off this opening meditation by sharing what are called the five remembrances or five recollections that in the Buddhist tradition are used as a practice to, to help us remember what, you know, what really matters, what matters most. <clears throat> the first is, I am of the nature to grow old. There is no way to escape growing old. I am of the nature to have ill health. There is no way to escape having ill health. I'm of the nature to die. There is no way to escape death. All that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. 
there is no way to escape being separated from them. And the fifth recollection, my only, <clears throat> my only true possessions are my actions and I cannot escape their consequences. So these five remembrances of sickness, aging, death, the loss of those we love and karma, that our only true possessions are our actions and the intentions that underlie our actions and that we can't escape their consequences. <clears throat> finish with Mary Oliver's poem, When Death Comes. When death comes like the hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps his purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg between the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness? And therefore I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I consider eternity as another possibility. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy and as singular and each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence, and each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say all my life, I was a bride married to amazement. I was a bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it's over, I don't want to wonder if I have made of my life something particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited this world. So I, I spoke last week about the Four Noble Truths, the central teachings of the Buddha, and I brought them into the meditation that we just had. These are the Buddha's teachings on suffering and the end of suffering. And I said last week that these are the most important truths that we can know in our life, in our lives. And they're the most important truths, arguably, you don't have to believe it, but arguably the most important truths because they're not just kind of factual, they're not just about information, but they are liberating truths. They're truths that free us, that can actually help us extricate ourselves disentangle ourselves from suffering. So the Buddha taught if these truths are really practiced and explored and investigated and followed, 
um, then they lead to the complete ending of suffering. And if that is in fact true, that we can end suffering in this life, though that would make these truths very, very powerful truths. You know, as I was saying, more powerful than even knowing, you know, what E equals M MC squared means or some, you know, scientific understanding or mathematical understanding or, you know, um, the truth about gravity or, you know, whatever, quantum physics or whatever. Um, those are very important and can be very helpful to us. But these truths free us. And uh, I mentioned, I said as well, that they're, they're not to be believed, you know, as a, as a belief, like, you know, you might believe in God or an everlasting life, but they're to be investigated in our own lives, in our own practice. And I mentioned this Pali word, ehipasiko, ehipasiko, see for yourself, you know, test it for yourself. And this quest for the end of suffering, you know, to find if, to find an answer to the question, is real freedom possible in this life, was what inspired the Buddha to embark on his search that lasted six years. He was 29 years old when he left the palace and cut off his hair and put on the robes of a wandering monastic. And as, as you're probably familiar with this story, um, he, and this is, you know, not just, um, legendary some of what we know you know in the teachings are kind of what has become legendary but uh, but some of the teachings are come from the the actual um discourses of the buddha himself who would say you know that he grew up in a in in a palace actually three palaces one for each season of the year a summer palace a winter palace and a palace for the rain season and you know he talks in some of the teachings about how you know, he had, you know, it, um, you know, he was looked after during the, I think it was the rain season. Um, all of the attendants were women and, you know, dancing and making life very pleasant for him. And the story goes, and this is the le a legendary story, but um, kind of is built on the teachings, is that his father didn't allow him to, didn't want him to, uh, to see that kind of the, the dark side or the shadowy side, shadow side of life, because there had been a prophecy when the Buddha was born that either he'd become a great monarch like his father, or else he'd go off into the spiritual life and become a wandering mendicant. And his father didn't want the latter to happen. And so he didn't kept from him all, all the, you know, the suffering of life and only had him experience just you know, the comforts and the luxuries. But apparently, you know, in the story, the Buddha goes outside of the palace walls and he sees four, what are later called four heavenly messengers. And there were a sick person, an aging person, a dead person. And the fourth was an ascetic, a wandering, wandering monastic, you know, who, who was, you know, didn't have anything apart from his clothes and his begging bowl but still seemed very serene and very happy. And it was these heaven, seeing these heavenly messengers um, that encouraged the Buddha, who wasn't yet a Buddha, Buddha meaning an awakened one, but it was on a path of awakening, um, to ask himself, you know, it helped him realize that, like, just as this person's sick, this person's aging, this person's dead, even though I live a life of comfort and luxury, these things will happen to me as well. I'm not going to escape this. So why should I seek happiness in what can't provide me with happiness? You know, if I'm going to die, just, you know, I've got comfort and luxury and everything else. But if I'm going to die, um, it doesn't make sense for me to look for happiness and well-being where they can't be found. 
you know, in living forever, that's not going to happen in comfort and luxury. That's not going to provide me, you know, would stop me being getting sick, getting old and dying. So the, the sight of the wandering ascetic encouraged him to think I should leave, leave the, my home, the palace and embark on this um, search. So, as I say, he cut off his hair and he put on, he left his, his home in the middle of the night. You know, he didn't want to cause unnecessary suffering and argument. And so he just, he left and uh, his parents were very unhappy and his wife and child. And, um, you know, sometimes people ask the question, uh, you know, isn't he, wasn't he a deadbeat dad, you know, <laughs> leaving the, leaving his, you know, one-year-old, I think a child, Rahula, his son was a, a year old and, you know, and, uh, you know, I, th I think the answer one would give, I would give is, you know, he wasn't yet a Buddha and he felt this, you know, this deep sense of, of uh, needing to answer this question, you know, and, and, and then that spurred his, his wandering and going out and, and searching for, you know, an answer to this question, is there an end to suffering? And, um, you know, it was that embarking on the search that led to um, his awakening, you know, after practicing a lot of ascetic practices and studying with leading teachers of his time, I spoke about that last week, um, it led to his awakening um, under the tree and what he what he understood, what he saw, was um, the truth about suffering, and that there is an end to suffering, and that he experienced that letting go, that really um, allowed him to never suffer again in his lifetime. You know, the roots of suffering were were eradicated; they were dug up. There wasn't any basis for suffering arising in the future. Um, the well-known say, you know, uh, saying, you know, that that the that the house house builder, um, you you'll no longer be able to, you know, build the house again. The, the The foundations have been eroded. Everything has been uprooted, and suffering can never arise again. And it never did arise again in his lifetime, at least that's certainly what the teachings tell us. So those of us who are practitioners may see ourselves on a path. We may relate to this path to the end of suffering. It doesn't mean we have to say, you know, I'm a Buddhist or whatever. But we could say, you know, this is something worth exploring. Certainly, I would say to myself, it's worth exploring. Can we live more freely in this life? Can we perhaps reach the end of suffering in this life? Um, is it worth practicing? Is it worth testing these, um, these teachings in practice? even to relieve suffering a little bit. I often share that quote from Arjun Chah, who says, if you let go a little, you'll experience a little freedom, a little peace in your life. Let go a lot, you'll experience a lot of freedom, a lot of peace. Let go completely and you'll experience complete freedom, you know, the freedom of the Buddha. Um, your struggle with the world will, will be at an end. So we might see ourselves on, on a path, to the end of suffering, or at least to the alle alleviation of suffering. And this, so in the Buddha's path, the vision of our journey is not from a state of sin to a state of grace, which in other traditions, certainly the Christian tradition would be that, you know, we're sinful, we, you know, we're born with original sin and, um, that we can, you know, through faith or through works, depending on how you see it, can reach a state of grace and ultimately you can achieve a eternal life. Um, and there's a, ten, you know, a tendency in other traditions to, to see, 
you know, more a kind of good and evil as the, the main division in life. You know, it may be between chosen people and not chosen people, those who are, you know, have the potential to, you know, to, to achieve eternal, eternal life and those who don't, you know, who, who, who are caught up in sin. So it's a different approach in, 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 in the Buddha's teachings, in the Buddhist tradition, what the kind of the difference is not between good and evil, but, but between ignorance and wisdom or ignorance and insight is between see, not seeing things as they are and seeing things clearly. And what I think is, I find inspiring is the understanding that no one is excluded from the potential to free ourselves, to live freely, to let to find freedom from suffering. Everybody, even the person doing the most harmful things in the world has the potential. There's always the potential for waking up to, to an innate freedom that we have. We may not in our lifetimes take advantage of it. We may be so caught up in our, in our ignorance, in our delusion, in our confusion, that we think, why would I bother with that? I have a nice life. I have a bit, you know, great ha house and wealth and all of that. This is great. But even with all of those things, as was the case with the Buddha, you may say, well, but what about, what do I do when I'm on my deathbed? How helpful will my possessions be, my luxury, you know, luxuries and the comforts of life be? So we may still ask that question, you know, is there something more to life than this? And so the spiritual journey in the Buddhist tradition and teachings is really one from ignorance to clarity, to wisdom, to insight, and to freedom. With that insight, with seeing clearly, <clears throat> and the practice of mindfulness is, is very, very much at the core of the practice to be able to see you know, pay attention to where we're, how we're holding on, where we're caught up, and to let go. You know, this is the second and the third noble truth, the truth of craving, the second noble truth, the, the, the truth of freedom from suffering, letting go of suffering, the third noble truth. So we suffer when we take refuge in what can't provide us with security. If we do take refuge in our possessions, or in our beliefs or opinions or our roles, how we're seen by others or by ourselves, or we take refuge in pleasant experiences. None of those things will provide lasting happiness. So a lot of the time we look for happiness where happiness can't be found. This, the Buddha talked about this as the wheel of samsara, just going from life to life you know, thinking that getting more of what we like will provide us with happiness and getting rid of what we don't like will provide us with happiness. But there is, the Buddha taught, uh, another way. You know, Arjun Chah, who I quote often, who the Thai teacher from the 20th century, spoke about two kinds of suffering. He says, there's the suffering that leads to more suffering. You know, this is the suffering that, of, that comes from craving something. You know, the suffering of addiction. We want something. We want this drug or this drink. And we think that getting some of it, getting more of it, is going to provide happiness. It's going to relieve our suffering. But the reality we know isn't that isn't the case because, you know, we get, if we're craving the drug, we get the drug, but it doesn't deal with the suffering because the problem wasn't the drug or the drink or the thing that we think that we need. The problem was this neediness, this wanting, this craving. It's not the thing itself that's the, that causes us the suffering. It's the holding, the craving or the aversion that causes the suffering. So that's what needs to be dealt with. You know, we could change one thing for another. 
we could change the drink for a drug or for some for some other thing but we'd still be caught if we if we haven't dealt with the underlying craving we haven't dealt we're not going to find our way out of suffering so the practices help us deal with the underlying craving the underlying neediness i need this i want to have this and we can deal with that by bringing awareness by bringing mindfulness how does that feel in the body what do i notice in my mind in my thinking in my needing my wanting what do i notice in my emotions and op opening to this opening to the feelings opening seeing their impermanence and finding a way of untangling ourselves from them in that way. <clears throat> One way of looking at our path is as a journey, you know, as, as consisting, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> of remembering and forgetting. You know, what we're cultivating is a remembering, remembering what really matters, remembering that we can be present, and then we'll get caught up in forgetting. We forget when we get caught up in craving. We think, oh, if I have this, oh yeah, this will be good. I'll be happy if I have this. Oh no, maybe if I have this, I'll be happy. And then, you know, what we're doing then is we're forgetting what really matters. But then when we forget, if we, all it requires is one moment of remembering to come back and say, okay, noticing, I'm seeing I'm craving now caught up in wanting, or I'm caught up in anger, caught up in worry. Okay, let me breathe into this. Let me feel the feelings. Let me, let me experience them changing, coming and going. And in, and in that way, disentangling myself from my craving or my aversion or my spacing out delusion. So this forgetting and remembering. And in order to remember, we need to practice. So this is a path of training. It's a path of training because what's going to help us remember is remembering. You know, remembering to remember. You know, the more we can set up the conditions to remember. For example, the five remembrances that I shared at the end of the meditation, I'll come back to in a moment. Those are ways, if we do that every day, if we remember, it's my nature to be sick. I can't es escape sickness, aging, sickness, death, loss, losing those I love. The truth of karma, the truth of of you know owning my my actions and my my intentions if i practice those remembrances every day then what happens is they tend to sink in you know like kind of water wearing away a stone you know that the, they tend to they tend to be easier to to go back to when we do forget oh yes you know if you have a loved one you know, maybe a partner or a spouse or somebody, you know, a friend, a good dear friend, you could practice these remembrance with remembrances with each day. And you say to that person, you know, I'm of the nature to grow old. And they say that to you, I'm of the nature to grow old. There's no escaping growing old and sickness and, 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 and death and loss. We need to train ourselves to remember. And that's really much of what this practice is. It's a practice of remembering. It's interesting that in the Pali language, the first language of the Buddha's teachings that they were written down in, um, the word for mindfulness is sati. Sati is translated into English as mindfulness. And it has the, the definition of mindfulness includes remembering. Sati mindfulness is remembering. And what we're doing with mindfulness is we're re remembering what, what matters. We're coming back and remembering. So remembering I'm of the nature to grow old, to have ill health, to die, that everyone I, I, I love 
is of the nature to change. There's no way to, to escape being separated from. And the truth of, of the, the remembrance of the, the only thing I own are my actions and I can't escape their consequences. And when we, <clears throat> excuse me, when we open to the truth of sickness, aging, death, losing those we love, the truth of karma, we open to the beauty, to the preciousness and the fragility of this human life. And it helps us to, to live more fully, more courageously, more compassionately. It also connects us compassionately with others, reflecting that they, like us, will die. They'll sit, get sick, they'll get old, they'll die. Remember that ref reflect on the words of Naomi Shihab Nye's poem, um, Kindness, where she says, before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see that how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plans and the simple breath that kept him alive. When we reflect on these remembrances, we, we remember, we see that even those we might have a great deal of difficulty with, you know, politicians maybe, or difficult colleagues at work, that if we reflect on this person is going to die, this person is going to get sick, like me, they'll get sick, they'll get old, they'll die, they'll lose those that they love. It helps to break down this kind of the separation, the barriers that we build up. This person is such and such, they're like this, they're so this or that, you know. And we, we can see their goodness underneath the stories we might have in our mind. The Buddha said, thus will you think of all this fleeting world, a star at dawn, a bubble in a stream, a flash of lightning in a summer cloud, a flickering lamp, a phantom and a dream. Arjun Chah, coming back to Arjun Chah again, he had a, a beautiful Chinese teacup that he would hold up and he, say, he would say, to me, this cup is already broken. Because I know its fate, I can enjoy it fully here and now. And when it's gone, it's gone. So I, I find that a really beautiful reflection that if we can think about those things and those people we love and really appreciate their goodness, their beauty, their kindness, all of the things that we love about them and reflect that this person is already gone, you know, in our minds, you know, as Rilke said in one of his sonnets, be ahead of all parting as though it were already were behind you, like the winter that has just gone by. Because among these winters, there is one so endlessly winter that only by wintering through it will your heart survive. You know, of knowing that this, this beauty, like the cherry blossoms, you know, that are here for a few days in spring, that, and then will be gone. But it doesn't make them any less beautiful. In fact, in many ways, it makes them even more beautiful, their ephemeral nature, their, their transience, their impermanence. So remembering, remembering sickness, aging and death, you know, as our, our, um, Don Juan in Carlos Castaneda's book says, you know, think of death as being on your, always on your left shoulder. And if you have a, a question, turn to your death and ask the question. Turn to your left shoulder and ask your death you know, the question. If we really, if we really um, 
hold death close to us. I believe it really makes life more beautiful, more compassionate. We can connect more fully with it. I've developed a practice just in the last year or so. The last thing I do when I go to bed at night after I do a little bit of reading, turn the light off and I reflect on three things. And I don't know why I came up with these three things, but one is, um, one is gratitude. Second is, is love. And the third is death. You know, and I may focus more on one, one night than the other, but I always reflect on death. You know, I don't know if this, you know, we don't even know one, one, night or one day we'll go to sleep and we won't wake up you know we'll we'll take our last breath i visited i've shared a little about this in the past i visited my mother um just after she died uh, a couple of years ago and uh, i went to the funeral home just the day i was still here so i flew over immediately and and um and I, 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 I spoke with the funeral director and he said, well, we haven't, you know, we haven't had time to do anything that we would normally do. So they were kind of warning me, um, you know, just to, that she was really as she was, um, as, she, as she died. And just to kind of, so I wouldn't be freaked out or anything. So I kind of said, yeah, that's fine. So I went in and when she, when I first saw her, she, her lips were like this, as though she was reaching for her last breath. And that, that was, that, and at that moment she died. And I, I there was a very, a very poignant mem memory to me to, to have just seen that, just how each of us comes into the world, you know, reaching for a breath and, and leaves leaves the world in whatever way kind of in some way reaching for for our next breath and i had the opportunity almost every day for the first week after she died to visit her and and for me that was one of the most powerful experiences of my life of you know this person that had brought me into the world to kind of be with her in her you know her early time after her death whatever as she went into the um, to the mystery, whatever that, wherever we go um, after when we die. So maybe just take a moment to reflect on, on those remembrances. I'm of the, the nature to grow old. There's no way to escape growing old. I'm of the nature to have ill health. There's no way to escape having ill health. I'm of the nature to die. There's no way to escape death. All that's dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There's no way to escape being separated from them. My only possessions are my actions, and I cannot escape their consequences. Thank you for your attention. And uh, Emily um, will lead us now in some movement. Thank you, Emily. Take a moment to stand and feel your feet feeling grounded into the earth. Then open up, swaying from side to side, enjoying the space within your being and the space without. And then come to center, bring your arms out 
and reach up. Gather the energy of the sky, the sun and the moon, and gather that energy in to your heart. Then gather the energy of all of us here together, our Sangha, the compassion and kindness and acceptance, and gather that energy to your heart. And then gather the energy of the earth, the abundance here, and gather in, pressing it to your heart. We'll uh, come into cactus arms and then just take a, we'll go to the right three times. I'm gonna go opposite you. So inhaling deeply, exhale to the right, back to center, to the right and center, and to the right, and center, then to the left, and center, to the left, and center, and to the left, and center. Flop your hands down, raising up, and down, and up, then reach up, up and up wrist with your right hand and tilt over to the right, bending, tilting, deep breath in, just a little bit lifting. Exhale, soften here. And then inhale up, switch hands and reaching up with an inhale. Exhale, lower, tilting over to the left and inhale, float your arms down. Bring your shoulders up, float them down. Place your hands at the back of your waist. Inhale here, lifting your head and chest. Exhale, extend your arms out, dropping them down another time. Inhale, lifting your head, lifting your chest. Exhale, lengthen your arms away from your body. Bring them back to your body. Float them, float them up. Take a moment to do your dance, whatever it is that you wish in this moment. And then come back to center. Place your hands above your knees and exhale, lowering down, bending at the hip crease, allowing your body to drop, lengthen. The weight of your head is pulled by gravity, upper shoulders, middle back. Notice as your spine lengthens. Deep breath in here, exhale, soften releasing, surrendering. And then place your hands at your knees and roll up your spine, lifting up, raising up and place your hands at heart center, release to the sky, release to the Sangha and to the earth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Emily. It's lovely, beautiful, wonderful to have a stretch. Um, just time-wise, I think we'll go into, uh, into a final meditation and uh, do our sharing in, in writing and then, um, I believe today uh, we'll, we'll have the lunch uh, session open. I mean, if people want to just continue in an informal way um, at lunchtime, um, as far as I know, we'll be doing that if you would like to do that. So let's, um, let's just take a few minutes to 
to sit together before we finish. You might close your eyes, let your attention come inward, drop down into the body. And just notice what's present for you right now. You know, after having had a meditation and talk, time for sharing, movement. Just notice what's happening for you in the body and emotions in the mind. So if you can hold whatever's present with a with an attitude of kindness, acceptance. This quality of curiosity is being interested in your experience. You could invite any area of the body that where you might be holding some tension to, to relax. Often it's enough just to bring awareness to an area and there's a natural softening, relaxing happens. Not always, but, but some of the time. Just holding your experience with kindness, with compassion. It's good to remember that we can come back to different resources, taking some deeper breaths, if we're feeling tense or stressed or worried, just inviting a couple of longer, deeper breaths. <clears throat> we can come back to the smile, again, helping us relax and soften. We can reflect on gratitude, remember some things we're thankful for in our life. It can help us shift out of that kind of something's wrong mode. Something should be different than it is. We can step into uh, an appreciation for what we already have, what's available here and now. Maybe appreciating our health, measure of health we have. I'd be grateful to live in a country where vaccination, vaccine for the COVID is becoming more and more available. Appreciate that. So much in our life we can take for granted. We could live our whole life in a, with a sense of neediness or not having enough. And gratitude like mindfulness is a practice. Just remembering making it as easy as possible for us to remember. So the more we do things, the more we repeat, 
the more practices become a kind of default for our, our consciousness rather than making our default complaining or grumbling, thinking about what's wrong, we can make our default appreciation, gratitude. You might appreciate the gift of Sangha, gift of community. that none of us are alone, that we support each other in our practice, <clears throat> in waking up. might finish our time together today by sending compassion to ourselves and to others and breathing in inviting a, a wish of kindness of compassion to yourself recognizing areas or parts of your life where things might be difficult. And holding your experience with kindness. Could be just a wish, may I be kind to myself or may I be happy Just breathing in a wish of kindness to yourself. And as you breathe out, you might breathe out loving kindness, compassion, out to all of us here together, wishing everyone well. You might bring to mind Perhaps those who were in a group with you, wishing them well. Just the faces you see on the, on the screen. May you be happy. May you be safe. May you live with ease and with kindness. Breathing in, wishing yourself well, sending kindness to yourself. And breathing out, breathing a wish of kindness to, to others here together, individuals or everyone. May you all be held in loving kindness, filled with loving kindness. You might let the wishes go out into the world more broadly, wherever your heart or your imagination takes you. Maybe holding in our hearts the people in, in Texas who have gone through some really hard times. Holding 
holding them in loving kindness. The people of Myanmar, Burma, where there was a coup a couple of weeks ago and people are pushing back and resisting. One of our members of our community, our Sangha, is there and Sylvie and sent a message to us asking that we hold, hold the people of Myanmar or Burma in our hearts at this difficult time. And all those struggling with the virus, you know, in hospitals and home, and all those worried about the health of others or their own health, here and so many places around the world. <clears throat> Sending out a wish of loving kindness, compassion. This is from Arjun Shah. Try to be mindful and let things take their natural course. Then your mind will become still in any surroundings, like a clear forest pool. All kinds of wonderful rare animals will come to drink at the pool and you will clearly see the nature of all things. You will see many strange and wonderful things come and go, but you will be still. This is the happiness of the Buddha. So before we finish, um, we'll have some announced couple of quick things from, from me. Um, I have a, a day long retreat this coming Saturday. Um, if you um, would like to join us, you could join for the whole day or for the morning or afternoon. So either the morning or afternoon, if you choose to just do part of the day. Um, it's called uh, opening to our hearts to change and hope kind of taking account of the period we're living in and kind of looking, touching into what's, uh, what, what, what may be, you know, possible um, when we orient our, our hearts and our spirits towards, towards hope. So that's next, uh, next Saturday, the 27th. And also, I'm, as I mentioned last week, I'm doing a four-week course on the Four Noble Truths 
four, six week course on the Four Noble Truths um, from April 17th, April 19th to May 24th. It's on the IMCW website. I'll, I'll um, post it, I'll, I'll paste it in the, um, in the chat. And uh, the final thing, um, and, and everyone, if, if you're, you know, want to deepen your practice, um, you're very welcome to join us for that. Final thing is there's no cost for the, for the sessions, for the classes. Um, you are invited if you choose to and inclined to, to uh, make a contribution of dana or generosity. As you know, it's how the teachings have come down through 2,500 years and your support is great, gratefully appreciated.